Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series reading White Fang by Jack London. Without further ado, returning to White Fang as read by Lord Naren White. I'll tie him up out of reach of each other tonight, Bill said as they took the trail. They had traveled little more than a hundred yards when Henry, who was in front, bent down and picked up something with which his snowshoe had collided. It was dark, and he could not see it, but he recognized it by the touch. He flung it back so that it struck the sled and bounced along until it fetched up on Bill's snowshoes. Maybe you'll need that in your business, Henry said. Bill uttered an exclamation. It was all that was left of Spanker, the stick with which he had been tied. They ate him. Hide and all, Bill announced. The stick's as clean as a whistle. They've ate the leather off in both ends. They're damn hungry, Henry, and they'll have you and me guessing before this trip's over. Henry laughed defiantly. I ain't been trailed this way by wolves before, but I've gone through a whole lot worse and kept my health. Takes more than a handful of them pesky creatures to do for yours truly. Bill, my son. I don't know. I don't know. Bill muttered ominously. Well, you'll know all right when we pull into McGurry. I ain't feeling special enthusiastic, Bill persisted. You're off color. That's what's the matter with you, Henry dogmatized. What you need is quinine and I'm going to dose you up stiff as soon as we make McGurry. Bill gruntled his disagreement with the diagnoses and lapsed into silence. The day was like all, like all the days. Light came at nine o'clock. At twelve o'clock, the southern horizon was warmed by the unseen sun, and they began the cold gray of afternoon that would merge three hours later into night. It was just after the sun's futile effort to appear that Bill slipped the rifle from under the sled lashings and said, You keep right on, Henry. I'm going to see what I can see. You'd better stick by the sled, his partner protested. We've only got three cartridges, and there's no telling what might happen. Who's croaking now? Bill demanded triumphantly. Henry made no reply and plodded along alone, though often he cast anxious glances back in the gray solitude where his partner had disappeared. An hour later, taking advantage of the cutoffs around which the sled had to go, Bill arrived. They're scattered and ranging along wide, he said, keeping up with us and looking for game at the same time. You see, they're sure of us, only they know they've got to wait to get us. In the meantime, they're willing to pick up anything eatable that comes handy. You mean they think they're sure of us? Henry objected pointedly. But Bill ignored him. I seen some of them. They're pretty thin. They ain't had a bite in weeks, I reckon. Outside of Fatty and Frog and Spanker. And there's so many of them that didn't go far. They're remarkable thin. The ribs is like washboards, and their stomachs is right up against their backbones. They're pretty desperate, I can tell you. They'll go. They'll be going mad, yet, and then watch out. A few minutes later, Henry, who was now traveling behind the sled, emitted a low warning whistle. Bill turned and looked, then quietly stopped the dogs, to the rear from around the last bend and plainly into view, on the very trail they had just covered, trotted a furry, slinking form. Its nose was to the tail, and it trotted with a peculiar, sliding, effortless gait. When they halted, it halted, throwing up its head and regarding them steadily with nostrils that twitched as it caught and studied the scent of them. It's the she-wolf, Bill answered. The dogs, had lay, the, the dogs had lain down in the snow, and he walked past them to join his partner in the sled. 
Together they watched the strange animal that had pursued them for days, then that had already accomplished the destruction of their half, of half their dog team. After a searching scrutiny, the animal trotted forward a few steps. This it repeated several times, till it was a short hundred yards away. It paused, head up, close by a clump of spruce trees, and with sight and scent studied the outfit of the watching men. It looked at them in a strangely wistful way, after the manner of a dog, but in its wistfulness there was none of the dog affection. It was a wistfulness bred of hunger, as cruel as its own fangs, as merciless as the frost itself. It was large for a wolf, its gaunt frame advertising the lines of an animal that was among the largest of its kind. Stands pretty close to two and a half feet at the shoulders, Henry commented, and I'll bet it ain't far from five feet long. Kind of strange color for a wolf, was Bill's criticism. I never seen a red wolf before. Looks almost cinnamon to me. The animal was certainly not cinnamon-colored. Its coat was the true wolf coat. The dominant color was gray, and yet there was to it a faint reddish hue, a hue that was baffling, that appeared and disappeared, that was more like an illusion of the vision, now gray, distinctly gray, and again giving hints and glints of a vague redness of color not classifiable in terms of ordinary experience. Looks for all the world like a big husky sled dog, Bill said. I wouldn't be surprised to see it wag its tail. Hello, you husky, he called. Come here, or whatever your name is. Ain't a bit scared of you, Henry laughed. Bill waved his hand at it threateningly and shouted loudly, but the animal betrayed no fear. The only change in it that they could notice was an accession of alertness. It still regarded them with the merciful wistfulness of hunger. They were meat, and it was hungry, and it would like to go in and eat them if it dared. Look here, Henry, Bill said, unconsciously lowering his voice to a whisper because of what he imitated. We've got three cartridges, but it's a dead shot. Couldn't miss it. It's got away with three of our dogs, and we ought to put a stop to it. What do you say? Henry nodded his consent. Bill cautiously slipped the gun from under the sled lashing. The gun was on the way to his shoulder, but it never got there. For in that instant, the she-wolf leaped sideways from the trail into the clump of spruce trees and disappeared. The two men looked at each other. Henry whistled long and comprehendingly. I might have known it. Bill chided himself aloud as he replaced the gun. Of course, a wolf that knows enough to come in with the dogs at feeding time. Do you know all about shooting irons? I tell you right now, Henry, that critter's the cause of all our trouble. We have six dogs at the present time, instead of three, as if it wasn't for her. And I tell you right now, Henry, I'm going to get her. She's too smart to be shot in the open. But I'm going to lay for her. I'll bushwhack her, as sure as my name is Bill. You needn't stray off too far in doing it, his partner admonished. If that pack ever starts to jump you, then three cartridges be what no more three whoops in hell. Them animals is damn hungry. And once they start, they'll be sure to get you, Bill. They camped early that night. Three dogs could not drag the sled so fast, nor for so long hours as could six. And they were showing unmistakable signs of playing out. And the men went early to bed. Bill first seeing to it that the dogs were tied out of gnawing reach of one another. But the wolves were growing bolder, and the men were aroused more than once from their sleep. 
So near did the wolves approach that the dogs became frantic with terror, and it was necessary to replenish the fire from time to time in order to keep the adventurous marauders at a sa at safer distance. I've heard sailors talk of sharks falling a ship, Bill remarked. And we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.